Hey there guys, and welcome back to some more Vampire the Masquerade, Coteries of New York. And this is going to be a longer recording session, so hopefully we can get through the rest of this, because I don't think it's really that much left. I know we've done a few hours into this of recording, but based on how the story's going, I feel like we should hit the end in, I don't know, like five or six hours? At most, maybe less, but I have a feeling five or six hours. So with that, let's jump right into it. Okay, so we're back at this. Um, let's focus on Agathon some more. Juno, the notes. You find the mystery of Agathon's research tantalizing enough to pay him a visit. You know what to expect when you return to a small bookstore serving as Agathon's haven. The cacophony of occult imagery assaults you from the book's covers displayed on the window, but under the fake facade, there's something real. This time, the boots and the satanic bibles at the storefront seem almost funny, or perhaps you've just started to tune into the dry humor of these tremor. Just as you're about to ring the doorbell, the door opens and Agathon storms out. You step aside just in time to avoid having him stumble into you. Coda. What are you doing here? Look, I came to help you. Like last time. Okay, fine. You're right. Follow me. As he turns to go, Agathon almost looks pleased that you're here. Agathon walks to his car with you in tow. It didn't occur to you last time, but it's a surprisingly pedestrian vehicle. An aging, mid-sized family sedan. You imagine what it would look like with a baby seat in the back. Opening the door on the driver's side, Agathon notices your look. Laugh all you want, but it's inconspicuous and practical. You sit in the car and Agathon starts driving in his usual careful style. At least you'll never be stopped by traffic cops. It seems Agathon is not interested in small talk. I love a good mystery as much as the next vampire, but at some point you have to tell me what we're doing. Let me ask you a question in return. Have you ever tasted animal blood? from sheep, for example? New York is not the best place to hunt for wildlife, you know? You'd be surprised. There are plenty of pigeons, rats, dogs, cats. But your instinct is correct. Animal blood tastes vile. If it didn't, our unlives would be very different. Anyway, something to think about. You exit Manhattan over the Brooklyn Bridge and soon reach the site of the nightclub that seems to be your destination. It's on the riverfront, a converted former warehouse. With a start, you recognize the place. The club where fate latched his cold, grubby hands onto your soul. You wanted to party, but instead you became a monster. How's that for a hangover? After Agathon parks the car, it's time for you to enter the nightclub. You glance at the Tremere evaluating him. It's obvious that this is not his kind of place. There's a good chance the research notes are here. So we're looking for research notes? Yes, and that's all you need to know. There's a line into the club. It looks like a popular spot, even if, based on the crowd, this is not exactly a place for supermodels and celebrities. Ah, eh, charm the bouncer. You walk up to the man at the door and smile. Hey, you remember me, right? Mind if we go in? The bouncer looks at you, taken in by your supernatural charisma. It doesn't matter whether he really remembers you or not. Sure, go right in. Have a great night. You walk into the club, ignoring all the people standing in line. The music beats down on you, bringing with it memories of a human existence. The first time you weren't dancing with friends, when you flirted with someone on the dance floor. This time, it's different. You're a predator, and everyone around you is prey. Tightly packed, twitching sacks of blood and tissue. You sense the emotions all around you. Blood tinted with happiness, lust, rage, jealousy, love. A buffet of sensations. Focus. Keep an eye out for trouble while I look for what we came to find. You nod and follow Agathon through the throng, trying to ignore all the warmth, flesh, and circulating blood around you. Eyes on the prize. You came here to help Agathon, and that's what you'll do. Agathon wades through the dancing people with purpose, but you have no idea how he is searching for the missing research notes. Perhaps he's using the enhanced senses of a vampire or some esoteric sorcery. At least he seems to know what he's doing. Juno. You swerve to avoid a drunken man who is just about to spill beer onto you and try to see what Agathon is looking at. A young woman, intense, purposeful, a little out of place at the nightclub, just like you and Agathon. 
Who's Juno? She's Tremere, a renegade. Bad news. The woman, Juno, elbows the drunken man out of her place and points a finger at Agathon's face. Agathon, you traitor. Don't you dare stand between me and what's mine. You look at the woman in surprise. Her appearance stands in contrast with the anger in her words. Juno, you know Aisling will not let you leave with the notes. Perhaps she won't let you leave at all. Juno pulls close to Agathon's face and stage whispers loudly enough for you to hear her over the music. You're still so brainwashed that you care about what Aisling fucking Sturbridge wants. I'm done jumping through her hoops. I don't know what I saw in you, Agathon. You're such a lap dog. What do you mean brainwashed? Are you brainwashed, Agathon? Agathon looks around the dimly lit, lit crowd, clearly too exasperated for words. That's what they do in the pyramid. Recruit us into loyal little soldiers for the Council of Seven, but no more. It's not the same thing as brainwashing. I work with Aisling out of my free will. Are you seriously telling me that Aisling asked your permission before she turned you into a fucking vampire? Agathon winces visibly at the word vampire. Fortunately, the loud beat of the music drowns out Juno's voice. That would make her unique among her kind. They sure as fuck didn't ask me. Actually, many vampires embrace only after asking for permission. This is so like you, Agathon. You just can't let anything go without making one of your little corrections. Juno, please. Juno steps back, suddenly cold, ignoring the people dancing all around. She stares hard at Agathon. The past is past. The traditions are dead to me. You won't stop me, Agathon. I'll make sure of that, here and now. You know I have the power. No, Juno, please. Agathon sounds panicked. He's not worried about his own survival, but of the possibility that Juno is going to unleash the genuine masquerade breach. Look around you. We're in a crowd of humans. If you start something here, it will be a masquerade breach. Catching on, Agathon joins in to support your argument. If you break the masquerade, it won't be just Aisling Sturbridge who has it in for you. It will be Kadir. Juno looks hesitant, worried. After a moment, she backs away. All right, you assholes. I'll play it cool. She slides into a dancing crowd. You see her move amidst the people, but it doesn't look like she'll start a fight. Give me a few seconds, and I'll verify if the notes are here or not. You idle among the dancers, and Agathon prowls clumsily out of, out of place in the throng. Finally, he comes back to you. They were here, but not anymore. The ritual I performed is very reliable. We can go. Juno will probably waste some time trying to find the notes here, and that'll give us an edge. You leave the nightclub. Outside, you walk to Agathon's car and drive back over the Brooklyn Bridge to Manhattan, heading for Agathon's Haven. Juno men mentioned some very personal things. I trust your discretion is not discussing those things with Aisling. Your love life is your business. Thank you. After a while, you reach Agathon's Haven and he parks the car. You walk to the occult bookstore and Agathon invites you inside. Smell of incense assaults you as before, making you grateful you don't have to breathe. You follow Agathon upstairs to find Aisling Sturbridge in an armchair reading an old book. She puts a bookmark in place as you come in. You were successful, I hope? No, I'm sorry. Notes were there at some point, but not anymore. That's a shame. I hope you don't run out of time. How did Sophie's little protege do? Agathon turn, turns to look at you. Well, surprisingly well. That's a surprise. I'll have to compliment Sophie on her choice. We met Juno. Fortunately, she couldn't find the notes either. That's interesting. The High Regent turns to look at you. What was your impression of Juno, fledgling? Mm, either driven or angry. Uh, I'd say angry. She was very angry. I don't know what you people did to her, but she's pissed. What we did. Careful now, fledgling. She made her own choices, bad as they were. Anyway, I have some things to discuss with Agathon. Run along now. You leave the occult bookstore, the cheesy, mystical music still in your ears as you walk away. You wonder about what happened with Juno. Why is she so anxious to leave her clan? Can she really do that? Could you leave Sophie's service if you wanted to? The hunger calls to you. You find yourself among the tall buildings and sprawling streets in New York City and can't help but- Oh, okay. Doing this again. People pass on, need to assault anything with a pulse and drink deep from light blood, compose yourself, rational mind, fearing breach of the masquerade, need to quench this hunger before it overtakes you and makes you lose control, 